through it. I'm going to talk a little. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, some efforts that myself and a few others in our group uh, have been working on over the last not quite year uh, to help our PhD students and postdocs and uh, maybe even the professors um, to sort of take advantage of uh, version control and get um, to do lots of things, making the code reproducible, sort of the end goal here. Um, <clears throat> so I'd just like to start by acknowledging that I live and work on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So I've got a really long affiliation because there are all these layers that have long names, but the sort of the smallest unit is the infectious disease dynamics unit. Um, we're a weird mix of people across like physics and computer science and epidemiology and uh, lots of other areas I'm probably forgetting. Um, but very broadly, most of our work probably falls under trying to under using mathematical and computational models to understand how infectious diseases spread in human and animal populations. Uh, what the impact of those uh, epidemics and uh, will be, and how the various ways that we might try and observe and intervene might help mitigate that impact. And our group's been informing Australia's national pandemic plans over the last almost 20 years. Uh, since very early in 2020, we've been involved and are still involved in doing data analysis and modeling to support our nation's COVID-19 response which has all been very exhausting. <laughs> um, but I, I guess you know, we have this very acute sense of, well, our research is feeding into decisions that um, is honestly sometimes quite scary just to, to have that feel that you're um, so tightly involved in, in decisions that have an impact on other people. Um, and so a huge amount of this work has been done in very short timelines, sometimes, like we haven't had people say we want the results yesterday, but we've definitely had phone calls late on a Saturday night saying we want results for a meeting Sunday morning. Um, and the questions and, and the, the things that are important and the matter are constantly changing. And so all the models and methods and all the sort of tools we've been, we've been building throughout our academic research activities always require modification. And and I know from personal experience that even without this sort of tight timeline, high pressure scenario, I will make mistakes. I've got a very long history of that. Um, and so for all of this work, it's testing and reproducibility, yeah, being, being confident that uh, all the code we're writing and the way we're handling data and everything, that it's doing what we think it should be doing. Um, and that yeah, unless we gain new knowledge, the results and outputs we produced today should be the same as the results and outputs we produced yesterday. Um, and so we're, we're pretty, we're, you know, we're good at this. this. In this sort of scenario, we do a lot of um, peer code review. We had like, people read every line of someone else's code because um, we had 48 hours to prepare our first report to the parliament uh, in response to COVID-19. So when we're doing work for government like this, it's, it's, it's really high pressure, but we do do a lot of it. We've had a lot of attention to making sure that we catch mistakes early. Um, more broadly, we, we have a much wider group of research students and, and research fellows and research uh, modeling and, and simulation type, you know, academic studies where we're not working directly with government in these really sort of high pressure um, situations. And for that stuff, we don't really enforce the same kind of uh, rigor with testing and reproducibility. I mean, individuals uh, and I'm one of them will try to keep doing it as much as we can. Other, other, other people we bring into the group, it may not just be something they're necessarily aware of or that they don't necessarily get exposed to. Uh, and so we're trying to embed better practices in our whole cohort. Um, and looking at materials that are out there, yeah, it's always challenging to say to people, do you have spare time to do something to learn something else that isn't say directly related to your research but will support your research um that's sometimes that's quite hard to sell um so we've been working on um, developing materials that explain why these practices are useful and then how to gradually uh, incorporate them into your own day-to-day uh, -day research um so we've been developing tailored training materials specifically for our cohort that sort of start by like, telling stories about 
here are the ways in the past that people in our group have really benefited from these practices. Here's where it's caught mistakes early, or here's where we've been able to audit and realize that a bug we found didn't affect any of the results in our last publication. Um, we're constantly pushing this idea that we're not trying to achieve some sort of abstract, ideal, perfect goal of doing everything perfectly. And then unless you would get there, there's no point doing this. You know, it's like you can make small changes that can have a big impact without making perfect use of all these tools and practices. Uh, and late last year, we ran a number of online uh, and in-person sessions to work through the materials, uh, see how they went and get feedback on them. And that was actually, that went better than we were figuring. Uh, you know, um, mostly very positive feedback. Um, and it's all available online. And the name we came up with it at the time when we put in uh, our sort of seed funding request was get is my lab book and that sort of stuff. So it's not catchy, but I hopefully at least conveys a bit of the gist of what we're trying to achieve here. <clears throat> um, now, in doing all this, uh, at the moment, what we've got to is saying, let's use version control to manage our own code, to collaborate with others, and let's use peer code review to as a way to share knowledge uh, and improve our coding and development practices. Um, and this is literally the first thing one of the research fellows said to me the very first time they met me. The first words out of their mouth, not even a hello or nice to meet you. Don't look at my code. And I have no idea where that came from. I wasn't like, in a habit of wandering around and peeking at people's computers. Um, but I think, you know, there is a real tangible sense of shame, I think most of us feel about our code. Right? and feeling that it's sort of it's horrible and no one should look at it. Um, and so quite often you may not show it to anyone. Um, and then if a journal says you need to make it available with your article, you know, potentially the first person who sees it is some random person you've never met who's looked at your article and thought, oh, I'd like to learn more about the code. So I think one of the biggest challenges we've had in getting this started is just figuring out how to sort of negate and, and, and uh, counteract these sort of gut reactions. Um, and we've come up with two different sort of approaches that combined, I think, have worked quite well. Um, and so the first one, this is me giving a talk last week uh, at our conference where we had our national um, modeling collaborators from around Australia and regional partners from across Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Uh, and I asked, I asked the audience lots of questions, <clears throat> things like, Hands up if you've ever found a bug in your code a day or two before a government report is due. And you'd be surprised how many hands went up and a lot of the really senior people. Um, and I think it was great for the more junior people in the room to look around and realize this happens and it's nothing to be ashamed of. I mean, you might not be proud of it, but you're not the only one. We've all, we've all done it, we've all been there. Um, it's a bit harder over Zoom. I won't ask you to put your hands up, but uh, you know, we're trying to normalize the idea that whatever you, whatever you think is bad about your code, it's probably true of pretty much everyone else's code. So it's okay. Um, and then the other approach we've used is humor, because um, that's sort of a great way if it works. Um, so for example, saying things like, this is a classic film about academic research practices. We write papers but we get feedback early and often from our co-authors and our writing gets better that's the good the bad is that we generally don't do this with our code we just sort of keep it secret and don't share it that's the bad and the ugly is that we don't share it because we feel this real personal sense of shame um and then likewise we can say well look let's how do you go about sharing code and again this is one of those questions where i'm not going to ask you to put your hands up but it works well in a you know in a physical conference is to say how do you share your code? Say with your supervisor, have you ever said, here's my code, and then realized, ah, oh, that wasn't actually the right version. I meant to send you another file or a different version of the code. Um, and again, uh, every time I've done this in a, in a room, people you say, hands up, who's ever done this? Or be, um, everyone puts their hand up pretty much. I need to. And we say, well, there are tools out there. This is this is a solvable problem. We can help you avoid this in the future. Uh, and there are lots of other benefits to using version control. So let's get started. Um, and so, yeah, we've had some really 
positive involvement across our early and mid-career researcher cohort and particularly the PhD students. Uh, I think partly because a lot of them may see that maybe just more aware that they're not necessarily going into a long-term academic career and these, these sort of skills are transferable to industry too. So there's, they're, they're, they're uh, hopefully broadly useful. Um, so what we've done is prepare the materials and evaluate them and we're writing up an education article uh, to see to report what went well and what we could do better. We still haven't got to topics such as testing, um, especially testing complex uh, stochastic or, or agent-based models, which is always challenging. Uh, we're in preliminary discussions about where we can help provide these materials and embed them in some of the different research and higher degree training programs. Uh, and we're looking to build a community of practice, which is essentially a, a forum to come together, uh, probably a, about on a monthly basis would work well, I think, for our group, just to come and, and have people bring in questions or problems or um, examples of things they've done that have worked well for, to share knowledge and, uh, and get feedback from uh, their peers. Um, and one last thing that we're also trying to do once we've got a bit more of peer code review sort of happening consistently across our group is just to say, well, acknowledge this in your papers, just like you would people who gave you feedback on your papers or, or other, you know, contributed in some other way, because this is an important thing and we should really um, put it out there. So uh, there, there was a reason why I used Lego in one of my other talks and I forgot uh, to leave, take that image out of this slide, but like, I just like to thank um, basically Eamon and James have helped us, help me um, design this and deliver this. Um, Spectrum and Spark are actually research network, networks that funded this. Um, and I'd like to thank Rowan for this invitation just to give this presentation and thank you all for listening. Um, so yeah, I'll stop sharing my screen if 